For his take on the election, welcome Bill Crystal. Thank you. It's really good to be with you. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? They introduced me. They said Billy Crystal. I think they said Bill Crystal. No, 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 no. They said Billy Crystal. Billy. I distinctly heard the Y. I'm pretty sure they said Bill, and I don't use the Y. How come? Because I'm not five. You should try the Y. I've done very well with it. Have you ever hosted the Oscars? Oh, you got me there. Yes, but but Bill Crystal does get to come on the Bulwark podcast. So welcome to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sex with our guest, Bill Crystal, without the Y. Better the Bulwark than the Oscars. I should have come up. I should have come up with that as we were doing that commercial, you know, or that 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 little thing for 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 Joe Biden. I, I, you you I, could I, do it again. I, I want to say it now on the record, though. Better the Bulwark than the Oscars. So that that was a hell of a crossover. The the, the Billy Crystal, Bill Crystal thing. I mean, that was. That was that was pretty interesting. That was great. That was awesome. I, oh, thank you. I mean, it was the idea of some uh, a democratic Jewish group, actually, and they thought we could appeal to uh, Jews in Florida. I don't know. I, hopefully, we could appeal a little bit beyond our fellow Jews, but that was sort of the the, the demographic. I my kids, of course, were going on about. That's great. What what exactly is your target audience there? Do you have to be over sixty or over seventy five? You know, so, kids, are, kids are great. You know what I mean. But, but actually, I, they did acknowledge once I pushed them that one of them that that one of her favorite movies was when Harry met Sally, and the others knew about some of the other movies, City Slickers, and yeah, uh, you were but, you were you were great in Harry met Sally. Yes, yeah, exactly. you really were. Really. So, okay, I'm here. We are 25 days out from the election, and I, I wanted to read you a paragraph from the New York Times before we get into the the news of the day. New polls show Mr. Trump's support is collapsing nationally as he alienates women, seniors, and suburbanites. He is trailing not just in must-win battlegrounds, but according to private GOP surveys, he is repelling independence to the point where Joe Biden has drawn closer in solidly red states, including Montana, Kansas, and Missouri, people briefed on the data said. So, wow. I mean, after all of this, if, I mean, I you can feel the Republican panic, Bill Crystal. If if only they had been warned. Yeah, exactly. No one. Well, but, you know, the thing is that it, he was strong enough. It, it, in some ways, it was a perfect, uh, I don't know, not a perfect storm. But you know, if he had collapsed earlier, of course, if it had been if he had been at twenty eight percent, the way George W. Bush was, let's yeah. just say, after the uh, bad prosecution of the war in Iraq and after Katrina. Then I think impeachment turns out differently. I think the behavior of Senate and House Republicans uh, is very different. In a funny way, Trump held up there long enough. One forgets at the beginning of this year when the pandemic hit, he was, you know, he was down. But I think a lot of people thought he had a pretty good chance to win, maybe 30, 40 percent chance. And they stuck with him and they made that bet. Well, you know, I don't want to count any God knows count yeah. before it's done and all that. But it uh, couldn't happen to a nicer bunch, I've got to say. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't have said this two, three years ago. I would have had earnest things to say about how important it is to keep some balance in Congress and uh, a lot of good Republicans out there. But I've got to say, after watching their behavior the last three years, as I say, uh, you know, good riddance. Well, you know, I mean, they had one off ramp after another and they just blew right past them. And, and here they are th- three weeks out from the election. So on my newsletter this morning, I, I said, you know, the thing about uh, Trump now is that he's really has saved the, the the worst for last. I mean, in a remotely normal presidency right now, the incumbent would be would have this well honed final argument. Right. He'd be talking about his successes, painting a picture of what he's going to do in the next four years, reaching out to swing voters, not having to worry about his base. Instead, here we are. And, and you know, yesterday, I mean, I say save the worst for, for last. I mean, that's that is one of those moments where you can use the word literally. So yesterday he's calling into cable who, you know, um, and he's you know calling Kamala, Kamala Harris, a monster and a communist. And then he goes on to, you know, spread more insane conspiracy theories. He's refusing to say that he'll accept the election. And then he then he calls for his it almost gets lost in the, in the shovel calls for his political opponents, including Joe Biden, to be indicted. And he's lashing out at his most loyal cabinet members, Mike Pompeo, Bill Barr. Just just throwing stuff up against the wall. 
It is. It is. No, I liked your newsletter as always mm-hmm. this morning. And don't we have to say here that people need to subscribe to Bulwark well, thank you. To, to keep to keep getting those excellent years and JBLs to do my two favorite things to read every day, really. Well, thank and, you. Uh, uh, in addition to the Bulwark website, which will remain free, but uh, and this fine podcast too. But um, so people need to subscribe to Bulwark Plus, and you can do that by going to the Bulwark website. But um, you know what's interesting? So I think it's three weeks ago tonight that Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg yeah. passed away. Um, uh, two weeks ago, that uh, tomorrow, that Saturday, that that uh, uh, Judge uh, Amy Coney Barrett was nominated uh, for her to replace her, though it had, uh, he had decided earlier in the week. And you know, whatever the, the whatever the truth of the Republican hopes that uh, it would be a big plus to have that nomination fight before the you know right now and to have it before the election, and that they did nominate an attractive candidate. You know, at least from the point of view of strengthening their base and firming up some voters who were repelled by Trump, but still wanted the justices and still cared, you know, thought the pro-life issue meant that they had to sort of support a justice like that and therefore had to support Trump. It wasn't a crazy play. I'm going to say if if you were sort of standing back and thinking, what cards does Trump have to play? I mean, he's not going to post about his handling of the pandemic. The economy is not great. Uh, He's personally pretty repulsive. But, you know, the justices, the justices, the justices. I don't know that would work ultimately. I think there's quite a lot of the country that isn't. Uh, doesn't necessarily want the court to move much more in a conservative direction, but whatever. I mean, she will be a good candidate, a good witness, I should think, next week. Anyway, a normal White House, just just making your point, would have spent the whole week uh, building her up, uh, touting the president's success and uh, praising the president for nominating her and trying to make that the dominant issue as we're, what, three and a half weeks out from the election. And instead, Trump has managed, one, one barely, one can barely remember that she's going to be testifying next week. Normally, that's kind of a big deal, the testif- testimony before the Senate Judiciary Committee. So it is amazing that Trump's you know, managed to, I, mean, I suppose he didn't plan on getting sick with, with COVID, but of course he planned on being reckless in the way he, think of that ceremony, incidentally. I, I know. It's so amazing when you think about it, an easy way to show a kind of basic, respect for public health by doing it in a socially distanced way. What is it that hard? Put the, put the chairs five feet, six feet away from each other on the White House lawn, tell people to wear masks. And that would have, the whole A, people wouldn't have gotten sick. And B, the whole image of, gee, you know, maybe he's kind of learning and all the people who would want to rationalize the Trump vote might have been able to, some of them. Now, you, how can you do it? Well, you know, you, you, this is a remarkable point, really, because I, I think that we'd all had in our future calendars, the the epic fight for, over the Supreme Court, if Ruth Bader Ginsburg was ever going to be replaced by a conservative, that this would be one of the most incendiary battles of our time. And yet you're right, we're a week away from it, and it it's completely overshadowed. You know, I, I was thinking when you were doing that timeline about Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies, was it three weeks ago? Um, th- think of all the things that have happened. You had the New York Times story about the taxes. Uh, you had uh, the debate. Um, you, you've had the coronavirus, all of these things, and, and they all, you know, seem to be coming together. And, 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 and Trump, it, it just it takes one blow after another, you know, n- not to mention, uh, the, the, the way in which he seems to be, um, shall we say highly medicated. I want to talk about the stimulus package in, in just a moment. There's so much going on. Let me just say one but, word about yeah, the COVID. Sure. I just think, yeah. trying, I know, as you, as you say, we all take for granted his behavior now. So yeah. it isn't worth commenting on, but it is kind of amazing that he gets sick, he goes to the hospital, he gets this fantastic treatment at Walter Reed, and presume maybe he's better now, we don't know, honestly, but I mean, he's only been better for a few days, whether he stays better or not, we don't know. But anyway, and instead of saying, you know what, I mean, I got this treatment, I want to, so appreciative of everyone who's helped me, and, and I want to say a word about those who weren't as lucky as I in terms of the course, the progress of the, of the disease, or perhaps, frankly, couldn't get the treatment that I got. I, I am committed to helping every, you know, it's such an easy thing yeah. to you. His own illness is a way of reaching out to others, not just who've been ill, and many have suffered from the disease, but to the, all the families who've lost someone and watched others suffer and are fearful of getting it. And instead, the egotism, the narcissism is so astounding that, again, it, it, there's no sympathy for him. Yeah, well, at least he promised he was going to give senior citizens, you know, the free steroids or whatever it was he was he was promising yesterday. Uh, so... The big story over the last 24 hours, of course, is is this. And, and I think this story is actually still shocking, even by 2020 standards, um, mm-hmm. although, you know, l- less so as time goes on, w- where you had the uh, police announcing that they they'd uh, they blocked this plan to kidnap and possibly murder the governor of Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, 
who's been a frequent target of Trump's verbal uh, attacks. And it's it, it, it's one of those those moments where you you do have to again ask the question, um, you know, how much kerosene are we pouring on the fire? What is the role that the president's own rhetoric is taking? And before we, we get into this, um, we, we have a couple of our uh, of, of friends now, Elizabeth Newman, who used to be a top official in the Department of Homeland Security, and Miles Taylor, who was chief of staff there as well. And they're commenting on what happened and, and possibly the, the, the president's own indirect role in this. Uh, this is what Elizabeth Newman has to say. I served in the Trump administration at the Department of Homeland Security and became the Assistant Secretary for Counterterrorism and Threat Prevention. Over the period of 2017 to 2018, we started to see that rise of the white supremacist agenda that I was asked, does the president's rhetoric make your job harder? And the answer is yes. The president's actions and his language are in fact racist. Things like, they're good people on both sides, or send them back from where they came from. The president of the United States refused to denounce white supremacist groups. Proud boys, stand back and stand by. Those words gave permission to white supremacists to think that what they were doing was permissible. And I do think that the president's divisive language is indirectly tied to some of the attacks that we have seen in the last two years. We are less safe today because of his leadership. I'm sorry, Mr. President, you've absolutely failed. Yeah, and uh, Gretchen Whitmer herself uh, underlined that. I mean, she pointed the finger directly at Trump. She said hate groups heard the president's words not as a rebuke, but as a rallying cry. When our leaders speak, their words matter. They carry weight. When our leaders meet, encourage, or fraternize with domestic terrorists, they legitimize their actions, and they are complicit. Uh, Miles Taylor um, basically makes the same point here. Clearly, the domestic terrorism threat is on the rise. The Department of Homeland Security just released uh, the first ever Homeland Threat Assessment, uh, which said that domestic terrorist groups are really uh, starting to surge in this country. It's a big concern. But this shouldn't be news to us, Allison. This is something that for years we flagged for the White House, but the White House was really disinterested. In fact, I would go as far as to say the White House buried its head in the sand when for the first few years of this administration, we flagged the severity of the threat. And they were worried, and the president was worried, that by talking about this issue, we would alienate people that he saw as his supporters. So that's red flag number one, obviously. Red flag number two, and as you all have covered this morning, the president's rhetoric uh, is being hijacked by these groups and is being weaponized by these groups to justify their activities. We, of course, have seen him frequently talk about fellow public officials as traitors and as potentially treasonous. Yeah. So, Bill, you know, it's interesting that with, with a president who has been very much about law and order and violent crime, uh, concerned about uh, in Antifa, very little to say about the domestic terrorists here. And in fact, his reaction was to send out uh, one of his surrogates, and then to attack Whitmer. And then he's been lashing out at her as well. What a terrible job she has done. So the, the day that we find out that there were folks out there wanting to kidnap and murder her, the president is attacking her. And not I, saying, I, look, I don't think, I didn't mean to encourage violence. I, I no. don't want to encourage violence. I don't, he can even say if he wants to defend himself, I don't think I did. I think I was just engaged in the normal political rhetoric. But, but, but given what's happened, I just want to read a normal president would say, even a normal president whom you and I would not like much would say, but given what's happened, I just want to reiterate, this is totally unacceptable. Uh, I stand with Governor Whitmer. You cannot have these kinds of, obviously, you can't have assassination plots. I praise the FBI for for, 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 mm -hmm. for breaking this, uh, this attempt and uh, seeming to you know, capture these people before they could do anything and so forth. And that's just normal, right? Even if you don't want to acknowledge your complicity over two, three years, which I think is real, of being at the very best uh, neglectful of, of, of this sort of threat and, and often, you know, kind of stoking the fire. But he hasn't said that to my knowledge at all, has he? He and the vice president and uh, even the attorney general, I mean, there's been kind of just silence about this kind of big deal, right? I mean, you know. Well, it, it is a big deal. And you and you know that this was left-wing terrorists, that there would be press conferences at the Department of Justice. You'd have Bill Barr out there. The president would be tweeting about it. Um and yet, you know, they continue to downplay this. And I have to, I have to say, I've been talking to a couple of folks uh, lately about the the threat after the election, particularly of violence. And um, a lot of people who 
I'm really surprised at about how many people are alarmed about this now. Um, the, the potential, you have a lot of people who uh, have guns, who have been fed this steady diet of these people are traitors, they're terrorists, they are, you know, they want to destroy everything in America, they are your enemy. Well, you know, should we be surprised when there are people who take that and then act on it? And it doesn't need to be a huge number of people who, in fact, uh, you know, are uh, ginned up by that kind of rhetoric coming directly from the president. No, absolutely. And again, maybe it's too much to ask the president to do what would be minimally responsible for any other uh, public leader. But, you know, we have a vice president, we have an attorney general, we have other senior officials in the government. We have governors, Republican governors, and we have Senator Republican uh, members of Congress. Could they say something? Would that be too much to ask? I mean, I, that, that, that for me is it always comes back to the complicity. You know, Trump is Trump. And I, I think we, the country, could have survived Trump a lot better if we had a sure. party that was willing to stand up to him and conservative elites that were willing to stand up to him, he would have been kind of isolated, kind of alone. Of course, it's been the opposite. And that really is where you get, I think, a, a terrible situation. Okay, so I want to have a slight digress digression to talk about something you tweeted out yesterday that I've been thinking about. Um, they, the, the White House uh, is using... Um, what what is which one of the Millers are we talking about here? The, which which one of the vile Millers? Jason Miller. They yeah. they put they push they push him out. Uh, he was on a lot of the talk shows over the weekend. Uh, Jason Miller was on Fox News uh, yesterday attacking Gretchen Whitmer, the victim of the kidnapping plot. He's, and he said, you know, if we want to talk about hatred, then Governor Whitmer, go look in the mirror. The fact she wakes up every day with such hatred. Okay, you you, you tweeted out about Jason Miller for people who don't know. This is a guy who's been completely disgraced. Um, I on on so many diff different levels, you know, admits going to prostitutes, you know, fathered a a child out of uh, wedlock. And, uh, this is a this is a long long string of things involving Jason. But you, you tweeted out there are dregs, and then there are the dregs. And I guess it really raises the question once again: Why are all of these misfit toys? attracted to the Trump and to Trump world? And why are they so like sort of omnipresent in Trump world? What is it about Trump and the dregs? Well, I do think there's a bit of a like to like thing. You yeah. Know, these people would not have great prospects in a normal administration. And uh, people like him, I don't think would be hired from by congressmen or senators in normal times. Anyway. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, well, you know, I was thinking, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, you obviously set the tone from the top, but there's also there's something about the moral nihilism that yeah. that, that that Trump has brought with him, and you know, we talk about how he's broken down all the guardrails, you know, and you know, shattered all the norms. Well, I mean, that obviously helps Trump, but it also provides that sort of umbrella of you know moral nullity for people like Jason Miller, all of these other folks who otherwise would have been in disgrace because of their various scandals, now basically go, hey, nothing matters anymore. It doesn't matter what my record is. It doesn't matter what the New York Times writes about me uh, anymore or what you know CNN or what guys like Charlie Sykes and Bill Crystal. I don't care. We've created our own moral universe where my sins are covered by this, you know, this this Trumpian amorality. Now, it doesn't always work because a lot of them end up in jail, right? I mean, or they have their lives destroyed. But you know, you do see some of these guys kind of climbing out of the shadows, the Bernie Carricks from New York, and guys like Jason Miller, and and he's he's given them, um, you know, a a a world that they can that they can, you know, thrive in at least temper at least temporarily. When without Trump. You know, they wouldn't you wouldn't hire them to run a 7-Eleven. I mean, you and I spent quite a lot of time over the last, I guess, what, 20, 30 years, really yeah. worrying about the general tone of the culture. Yeah. Standards. Pat Moynihan referred to, I think, to defining deviancy down. And we were alert to that. And I think in a fairly serious way. And, and I think one of the things about one of the contributions of social conservatism uh, to the public sp uh, square uh, even if one didn't agree, perhaps, on every particular issue, was a kind of willingness to say, no, 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 we need to keep some basic standards. Yes, there'll be some hypocrisy. Yes, not everyone will live up to them. But there needs to be kind of a general level of, of decency, respect for, for our fellow citizens and so forth, um, politeness, almost decorum even. Uh, I mean, that just seems, of course, ludicrous now. But again, it, it is 
done huge damage, in my opinion, to what is a reasonable point of view. That is, it's the social conservative. I mean, Trump destroys everything. You know, I, yeah. I just I did a podcast with someone from abroad, and he was saying, "Well, wait, isn't Trump at least right on some of these issues? I mean, if you care about." Free markets? Shouldn't you prefer Trump to Biden? And I said, no. He's done. No. He's, he's a crony <laughs> capitalism guy. If you're a 20 year old and you've grown up in this circumstance, you hear someone say the word free markets. You look at Trump and you think, I don't want that. So he damages everything he claims to be for. I wish some social conservatives, more social conservatives than than us, <laughs> would speak up and say this. He's doing huge damage to everything these people have claimed to care about for 10, 20, 30 years. I mean, some have, to be fair. There's some really well, wonderful evangelical leaders who've courageously stood up against this, uh, stood up uh, and said this is terrible and a terrible uh, damage to their Christians uh, who stood up, uh, our friend Pete Wayner and many others who said this is really uh, terrible for, the, for this to be rationalized. But the damage it does, I think, going forward, it's not, it doesn't end on November 3rd. You know, people don't forget and right. that there was such complicity and, and pretending that Jason Miller, that was great. Hey, you really showed them, you know, I mean, God. Well, you know, and, and this, this is the, the moment we're at right now. And, and I'm, you know, we're going to have to struggle with the, we told you so thing and we'll fail, you know, at, at resisting that. But there have been people who have spent the last four years trying to rationalize their support for Trump, saying, OK, we can we can tolerate this because we're going to get the judges. We're going to get a tax cutter. We're, we're going to get all this. And what feels like it's happening right now in the last three weeks is that the rationalization has just crumbled in their hands. It's just it's so awful. It's so terrible. They know they enabled this. They know they can't defend it. Uh, you know, they'll still lash out. I mean, that's why we have like a, a 5000 tweets about Joe Biden's disqualified himself because he won't answer the question about court packing, which kind of feels a little bit like Hillary's emails for, for 2020. But, you know, what Trump is, is, you know, he is embodying everything that they knew was there and that they were warned against and that they thought that they could ignore. And here he is. And no one is in a position to go to him anymore. Say, you know, Mr. President, stop destroying yourself. You can just tell you've destroyed that entire infrastructure of people who would have been the quote unquote adult in the room. You know, and for me, I think that's a, that's well said. And for me, it's, it's it also the unwillingness to say, if you had this view, this isn't where we are, but I understand this view that, you know, he did some good things and the justices were important. I, justice, a potential justice, a Barrett is important. And people mm -hmm. say, I mean, I think it'd be better to put it off till after the election, uh, given what happened in 2016. But other people say, no, 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 very important to go ahead with the confirmation. Fine. People can take that view and they can defend various policies and so forth. But they, but then for them to say, but, you know, and also I want him reelected. What is why? I mean, how can anyone look in the mirror and think, yes, four more years of this, given his behavior, given the trend line of his behavior and the kinds of people who are around him, as you said, the Jason Millers and the sycophants in the administration, how can they say that? I would respect someone who said, you know, I'm going to, I want her confirmed, but I also will acknowledge that we shouldn't then give him, he did some good. We got some good out of him, frankly, if you're a, a someone who wants a much more conservative Supreme Court. Uh, and but we can't we can't tolerate another four years. I would respect someone who said that. And there are a few people who've said a version of that, you know. But what's amazing is that 90 percent, I'm going to really say 98 percent of the Trump apologists, including the quite, you know, well-educated and uh, intellectual ones, aren't willing to sort of draw that line, which I think would be respectable. And instead, you know, uh, no, we're going to defend all those things. And furthermore, he's much better. We need another four years of Donald Trump. They didn't yeah. support a primary challenge. They won't support Biden, even though Biden is, you know, a moderate Democrat who defeated Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren in the primary. Some of them will at least go to a third, say they won't vote for Trump. They'll support a third party or sit it out, which I, I respect. It's not quite where I am, but but a lot of them are going to vote for Trump. And what is that? Are they really, I mean, I just don't know how you make, how you could justify that, honestly. I also think, I agree with that, but I also think that there's a number of them who are out publicly defending Trump who might privately actually vote for Joe Biden because it will be such a relief for them not to have to defend Trump anymore because in their hearts, they kind of know that, you know, what a disaster the second term would be, that things are bad right now. I mean, this this last three weeks and the next three weeks, um, really, you want to do this for another four years, honestly? Is that where you're going? And and I, I'm looking at the numbers, and I always I always try to distance myself from what my, my, my gut sense is versus what the reality is out there. 
Um, but I said earlier this week that I had a feeling that the mood was shifting from exhaustion to disgust. And every single day that the president sort of doubles down on on his own sweaty self, I think the disgust rises. If he really does go out on the road with a super spreader campaign, I think there's there's going to be a backlash to that. If he continues to you know demand the criminal prosecution of his political opponents, um, I, I think that there's going to be there's going to be a pushback. By the way, just the irony. I guess I'm I'm I agree with everything you said about the Supreme Court, but but it's interesting the shorthand version of conservatives who will insist that. They they want conservatives on the court because they want somebody who will uphold the rule of law, right? Who will, um, you know, strictly uphold the Constitution. And then they look at at Donald Trump, who is just blowing through one constitutional norm after another and threatening to use his power to, you know, throw his political opponents in jail. And it's like, does that cognitive dissonance ever cause their heads to explode? Yeah, I don't know. Is cognitive dissonance a thing anymore? That's a good no. question. You know, that would be a, that's a deep, that's a deep yeah. point. Um, yeah. Trump, Trumpism, I guess it was Jonathan Last who said this first, maybe four years ago, yeah. Trumpism corrupts and yeah. it really has in so many ways. Okay, so let's talk about the, this weird development today. A few uh, days ago, president tweeted out that he was completely done with the stimulus talks, the, the coronavirus relief bill that he'd instructed his people not to negotiate until after the election. And that was that was a pretty definitive statement. Today, we're hearing that he's done a complete 180, that he is all in on wanting a deal now, and he wants it very, very badly. So give me your thoughts on this. I mean, first of all, how do you negotiate a massive relief package like this when he, he's not on speaking terms with the <laughs> with the speaker of the of the house who he, who he's tweeting out is is crazy? How does that happen? I guess you ask your Treasury Secretary to do yeah. it, and you assume that Nancy Pelosi, you know, wants enough, uh, you know, both for political reasons, but also, to, you know, for the country and to get something passed. But I mean, we're now uh, Senate's out for two. I think uh, Senate and House are out there. I guess they're on pro forma; they could come back, but uh, for two weeks now. And so, I mean, he's not going to get anything fast enough for it to show up in anyone's you know, uh, unemployment insurance or whatever, I guess he would like to be able to say that he's helping people. No, it's total irresponsibility, total lack of total misgovernment. I mean, again, if, if Mnuchin and Pelosi could have had a deal, no question. People thought Trump would go for a deal. They thought it was in his interest. I it think was in his the interest. The Fed chairman said it would probably be a good idea economically. Uh, I don't know whether he'll get something nominal now or not, but I do think it, it sort of fits into what you were saying, that it just conveys the general image of utter disarray, utter ridiculousness and impulsiveness. You know, it's not, it's one, again, if you, if you could excuse the personal failings by saying we're getting good policies, but who could really say that now with a straight face? Well, I, the calculation for the Democrats is, is going to be interesting. And I, of course, I'm, I'm not privy to what their thinking is right now. I mean, there's there are real needs out there. There are industries that are about to collapse. There are tens of thousands of people who are about to lose their jobs in the airline industry, Amtrak, uh, we're just all across the all across the, the board. So, I mean, there's a strong case that something absolutely has to happen. Otherwise, the consequences will be bad and they will go into the next president. So an incentive to really do something. On the other hand, I could certainly also imagine Democrats saying, why would we want to hand uh, Donald Trump a quote unquote victory before the election? Because you know that he will claim that it's all him. He'll have a signing ceremony and no Democrats will be invited so how do they balance that out again against one another? Yeah, I mean, I think that's where they're a little bit torn, but I, I honestly do think they should do what's right for the country. Well, yeah, yeah, I don't I think the politics of it are going to be terribly d decisive. People aren't going to suddenly decide, oh, Trump made this happen. He can have his signing ceremony and say this. I mean, if I were Pelosi and Schumer, I'd be very careful to point out that <clears throat> they were willing to do this weeks and months ago, that they passed, the House has twice passed bills. That it's Trump who blew up the negotiations. I would make do some ads with Trump's earlier tweets in them, and say, "Thank God he's come around, and and you know I'm glad we're glad to be able to pass this bill." But uh, you know he deserves no credit. I, that's probably a, a message they can sustain. Well, also, I, I mean, I think that the, one of the big questions is whether or not Republicans in the Senate are going to go along with all of right. this. I mean, I mean, if I'm Nancy Pelosi right now, the president is clearly panicking. He's doing exactly what he said you don't do in the in the art of the deal, which is you never let your opponent think that you are desperate. He's obviously desperate. So he's violated his own rule. She knows that he wants it badly. 
she could ram through pretty much anything. And she could, you know, three, four trillion dollars put in everything she wants and just, you know, put it on his desk and dare him to sign it. But it may be the Senate who goes, uh, we're not interested. We're too busy with the Supreme Court. But don't you think, Charlie, that I was thinking about this, that Pelosi insists on, let's say, the original bill, which was the big uh, yeah. bill, uh, the big economic package that, that, that they passed through the House, insists on that or something like that, maybe just insists on that since it passed it already. And then say, tells the president, you have to accept this. You have to persuade enough Senate Republicans to support it. We'll get 47 Senate Democrats to support it probably. So we need, depending on whether you need a supermajority or not, we need, what, three or 13 Senate Republicans to support it. And you and Mitch McConnell have to make this happen. Now, I do think, incidentally, a lot of Republican senators would support it. I can't, I mean, I can't imagine that they're going to vote against it, but it's a choice of that or nothing. But they have talked themselves, there's been there so much honestly, silly rhetoric of a kind of leftover conservative kind, you know, mindless, you know, that's too big. The number has to be 1.5. I don't honestly have a foggiest idea whether the number should be 1.5 or 3.5, but there's been no argument about it. It's all just instinctive. Well, the Democrats want to spend too much. We want to spend less. They may have been right on that if they had actually made the argument for the last three, four or five months. Having failed to ever make the argument, I think Republican senators are going to look pretty silly if they suddenly balk at something that the, the the Democrats in the House, the Democrats in the Senate, and the president would be for. So I actually think Pelosi has an extremely strong hand to insist on the kind of bill she would like to see. So what do you think of Mike Pence and uh, Kamala Harris the other night? You know, it was better than the presidential debate. That's a very low bar. Very um, low bar. Uh, I, you know, I, I think I, I personally find Pence's unctuousness and smarminess sort of intolerable at this point. Uh, but whatever. I mean, he's not a, an idiot. And he, he made his arguments. And he, he got a couple of things. He probably little rounds. He won on points against uh, against Kamala Harris. I thought she did well, though. I, I, I thought the key thing, having been through a vice presidential debate myself and having prepared for it, you got to remember that it's not about, no one's voting for them. So the question is, how does it affect the campaign? And I'm sure what the Biden people told uh, Senator Harris over and over again is, look, you're not going to like this much. You're a fighter. You will want to go after him when he says something creepy and condescending, when he interrupts the moderator and goes over time as he did over and over. But you've got to be don't give them any grist for the mill of, you know, being short tempered or, 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 or being too left wing, frankly. And so she really went, I, I was impressed by her discipline. She did not, I mean, she was really treated badly by Pence several times. Yes. Stomp, st- stampeded over Susan Page, you know, who did her best. I've got to say, I, I give, I give Senator Harris credit for disciplining herself and and not rising to the bait not not uh, chastising vice president pence when he was you know stampeded over susan page and uh, spoke longer than he was supposed to according to the rules and, and really was disrespectful i've got to say of of the moderator of susan page uh, i give her credit for uh whatever she thinks and she's more liberal than joe biden she stuck with the biden playbook in terms of you know we're not against fracking and we're, we're not uh, we don't want to destroy the economy we're not going to raise taxes on people under uh, 400,000. So I thought she did well. I thought the one, so I'd say t- only two points. I think the one thing that, one question about debates is what's left out there? I mean, a lot of stuff is back and forth. The parties on e- either side or with their person. And there's no actual net effect as it were. No. The none. one thing that I think she, point she made, and she made it twice and made it pretty effectively, and that he, Pence never answered was the pre-existing conditions point, which Biden did not do a very good job on in the first debate. It was kind of confusing, and he was talking about Obamacare, and it wasn't clear how it affected most Americans. Her statement, very direct statement, that you are at risk, I mean, leave aside the merits and the the, the complexities of the issue, was, I thought, quite effective, and he never answered that. So I thought politically on healthcare, which is a huge Republican vulnerability, she was effective. And I thought on on substance, if I can put it this way, for me, the striking thing was hit, Pence's refusal to uh, answer a direct question from Susan Page by saying, of course, we will obey. Of course, we will honor the election results. And indeed, I urge people to be calm. I urge people to wait until all the votes are counted. I urge people not to take things into their own hands. No denunciation of, of possible violence or of uh, viol- or of you know challenging the rule of law in terms of the election results. And so I think that was for me, that was bad. I mean, Pence knows better. And he could have said that. And I guess maybe Trump wouldn't have liked it. But, you know, he's the vice president of the United States. He's not just some guy running for city council somewhere. And he has some obligation to say something like that. I think, you would think so. In light of the Gretchen Whitmer thing, which came out, I guess, the next day or two. You know? 
Yeah, you you would you would think so. And I guess I was expecting him to be strong in the debate. I think that people had underestimated his debating ability. But you used the word that kept coming to my mind over and over again. And I, I think I saw somewhere on Twitter that there was a, a record number of, uh, of of searches of the word smarmy <laughs> and, smar- and, and smarminess. I think, you know, was it Merriam Webster dictionary said that we had a record number of, you know, people because it was it was smarmy and it was I guess I was really struck by the the Trumpification of, of Mike Pence. Yeah. Remember, he was supposed to be a little bit of a, uh, of a, of a balance to, to Donald Trump, but he's, he's basically become, you know, tr- Trumpy in, in all of the, in all of the, the negative ways. And of course you, I don't know, Jonathan last had his newsletter yesterday talked about, you know, if Mike Pence is the future, you know, God help us, because is this the direction that we're going? And, you know, his, his, his attempts to, uh, defend the, the failed pandemic response or to compare it to the Obama administration, uh, it, you know, uh, you know, swine flu or what it was it, H1N1. Yeah, that was which, which, stupid. Just ridiculous. Just ridiculous. Yeah. That was a hell of a talking point. Like, let's bring up something that happened 11 years ago that led to very, you know, thank God, to rather few deaths and that was handled quite competently, most people thought, you know. No, it was, it was, it was bizarre. It was, it was disappointing. But as you point out, <clears throat> it's not. It's not going to make it. It's not going to make any difference. So we always don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Um, but give give me your sense of of where we are at in terms of the election. I mean, you know, we all look at these polls, um, and I, you know, I, given the given given the trauma of four years ago, I, I think there's that that pressure, you know, internally, um, n- not to give in to the optimism. But uh, you know, you look at the polling average, the consistency, the stability of the polls. What what are you what what are you feeling right now? No, I, I think the odds are very good for uh, for Biden. I mean, I, I'm worried about election day and about sort of uh, the things that could happen in the next three weeks to try to divert people, disinformation attempts to stop people from voting, as we're seeing in Texas. So I think that's actually probably more of a threat to to Biden's lead than anything Trump's going to say or do. I do think you mentioned in passing the stability. That's very important, just analytically as a kind of political science matter. Makes a big difference to have led a race all along, to have been around six or seven most of the time, plus six or seven, to have dipped down to three or so when there was a bit of a rally to the flag effect when the pandemic hit. Uh, now it's cre- crept up to eight, nine, maybe ten. That's that's a you know you need something pretty dramatic to dislodge something that's been so stable. If it were bouncing around crazily, then you'd have a situation where it could bounce back the other way, right? And there have been races like that more in the seventies and. Uh, 80s, maybe then early 90s, even the Clinton race, Clinton Bush, then subsequently when there's more polarization and people are more set in their views. I think the combination of Biden's pretty sizable lead and the stability of the race makes it hard to see how there's a Trump comeback, you know, absent some really extraordinary event. Well, also, you know, the fact that he's been above 50 percent in so many of the polls would suggest just mathematically that if all of the undecided voters broke for Donald Trump, there still wouldn't be enough votes to win. I mean, that's that's the significance of 50 percent. So is there what could happen between now and Election Day for uh, people who are telling pollsters right now they've decided to vote for Joe Biden, um, that they're going to switch and vote for Donald Trump? Because that's what's got to happen. I think uh, nothing that Trump does. I mean, how could he change people's views that dramatically in the next three weeks? I think it would have to be a disqualification of Vice President Biden, which presumably could be, I guess, a health incident or something <laughs> crazy that he or, yeah. or or Senator Harris says, or you know, or something that. I mean, I worry a little that they'll they'll invent something a la Ukraine, and let's not forget why yeah. Trump was a beat, yeah. you know. So, but I, it's yeah, I think they will just go double and triple down on disqualifying the Biden-Harris ticket. And as Trump said yesterday, she's a monster and a communist. I mean, really? That helps. Monster? I mean, I was not a, I, there were others I would have slightly preferred as vice president to Senator Harris, but I mean, a monster, really? Well, I, I, I think it's it's a, it's a sign of sort of the desperation that uh, that so many of the folks in Trump world were really counting on this Durham investigation to come out before the election and there'd be, what, indictments of people for quote unquote, Obamagate. And now we're finding out that that's not going to happen before the election. I don't even think that would have changed things. I mean, I, I think that at, at, at this point, um, vote, there's, you know, there's there's sort of the white noise in the background and all the Ukraine stuff and all of that feels like the white noise in the background, um, because you know that whatever happens next week, it's going to be overwhelmed. There will be this major Supreme Court uh 
uh, you know, hearings and vote and all of that. So for anyone to think that Bill Barr is going to be able to announce some investigation or some indictment that's going to change anything, this is not 2016 anymore. This, this, is, this is not where the James Comey is going to come in at the last moment and upend the entire election. Although we all have that at the back of our mind, right? We sure do, you know, and uh, everyone's going to be on very nervous, I would say, until November 3rd and maybe after, depending on how Trump and, and his administration behave. It, it, exactly. So, um, Billy Crystal, thank you so much ah, for, for joining me. Reenact that. That's Bill. I thought you wanted Billy, right? <laughs> that was, that was Charlie, nice. You're Charlie, you should be on Billy's side on this, you know, and, and, and uh, did you ever think of growing up and becoming Charles or Chuck or something? Okay, so this is an interesting question because uh, for many, many years, um, I was Charles and everything I wrote was Charles J. Sykes. And I didn't really like Charlie that much. I mean, so my friends could call me Charlie. And um, my grandfather was also named Charles Sykes and he went by Chazzy. Okay, <laughs> so, but I was Charles, really, except in, you know, and then you know, over the years, it's like, oh, to hell with it. Just go with the Charlie, you know? So. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I know that at this certain age you should become Charles, right? But I'm, I guess maybe, maybe you know. Mr. Sykes or Sir, as Trump likes to be called. You know. So were you ever Billy? Yes, I mean as a little kid, honestly. But I think I moved away from it, or I don't know, my family. We all moved away from it when I was, I don't know, elementary school or something like that. But yeah. Did Did you go right from Billy to Bill, or was there a phase in which you were William? No, no, pretty much <laughs> always Bill. I've got to say, yeah, I should insist on the distinguished. William Crystal, but I, I don't quite have the nerves to do that. So, All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. We've only got 25 days to go, Bill. Yep. And let's uh, let's make it through those 25 days. <laughs> and thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back on Monday and we'll do this all over again. <laughs>